it was kind of funny when when you first learn how to program i don't know if you know anyone who's listening to this if you've done your first program first couple of programs when you finish your program and you watch it run and produce the results you want and it's passing all the tests mm. it's kind of of a it's kind of like a a little bit of a high oh, almost okay. a little yeah, bit of a high yeah. like to watch your watch your program run and complete like that's dope like i watched my program i did, that. I, I did yeah. that it's running I built that What's up, guys? Welcome to another episode of Consciously Curious, where we dissect people that are thriving in their passions. Today, we have a special guest. We have Mr. Toby Tong from Microsoft. He's a software engineer for them. Shout out to Sienna, his sister, for the big intro. Um, so, Toby, welcome to the show. Um, thanks for spending the time. I know you're a very busy person, <laughs> um, engaged in, in all that, getting yeah. ready for wedding season. But in your own words, can you describe what a software engineer does? Yeah. A software engineer, um, we take a problem, okay, you know, and usually it's a problem that doesn't have a solution yet, okay, and we just open up our computers and we find a way to solve it. And it's not just solving the problem and just brute forcing a solution, but it's doing efficiently, mm. keeping um, in mind like what's what's the performance of our code, how mm. efficient is our code, how do we build something that solves a problem but also doing it in a way that's cost effective mm. and high performance and just overall high quality. That's awesome. <laughs> you know, for, for a career that seems very analytical and technical, mm. we're going to get into this, but I feel like there's a lot of creative to it. Oh yeah. You have to be creative. That's awesome. Yeah. It's, it's one of those fields that there's just not one answer, right? You can't yeah. open a, a standards book and um, look for the answer. Right. Because, right. Because it's about, it, it, you'll, 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 I'll, you know, I'll tell you throughout the interview. It's, just, it's one of those things. Is like, you have to be able to um, find different ways of solving problems because mm. there's not one solution fits all. Yeah. And that's when you're interviewing for tech jobs. Is that's what they look for. It's like they throw curveballs at you, see how you could, mm. you know, adapt. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So if we were to rewind the clocks, um, at what point in your life did you know that? Um, like what, what led you to this? Like when did you know? <laughs> oh my God. My life is kind of crazy. I, I, <laughs> I'll be honest. I did not know that I was interested in computer science until about halfway through my undergrad. So okay. I did my undergraduate degree in electrical engineering. Sure. And before I even went to college, um, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And I, you know, my mom's like, you're pretty good at math. Why don't you maybe look at engineering? I was like, you know, uh, maybe. <laughs> it was funny. Is my mom was an engineer, and I fought my mom on everything. You know, growing up as a kid, I was like, Mom, you're an engineer. I don't want to be an engineer. Mm -hmm. And I went to school actually, like, actually, I I I started as a business major for the first month. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and I just. It just wasn't for me. Yeah. And that literally the next that next month I was transferring over into the engineering college. Okay. And uh, decided to major in electrical engineering. Um, I've always liked physics, uh, math, you know. Right, right. All, all kind of the STEM stuff. So I think yeah. I picked electrical because I felt like it was the – to me, it, it just felt super technical, but very broad and like okay. what you can go into. So okay. you can go into. So at that point, you still didn't know exactly what you I still didn't know wanted. what I wanted okay. to do. Yeah. So you have like, you can go in power and distribution. You can go into microelectronics. You can, mm. you can, I've met electro, electro engineers that became like programmers, you oh, know? Okay. And so it, I just saw that it was such a, such a vast field that you can get into. And, you know, I'm not going to lie. It's a, you go, you get a degree in electrical engineering, finding a job is usually in your favor, sure. you know, if you're pretty good at your craft. And back then, I remember everyone saying, it's like, oh, you know, make sure you pick a, my mom was really pushing me. She's like, make sure you pick a major that, you know, you can find a really good job in it. And, and, you know, it was, it was one of those majors that paid well and had a lot of opportunities out there. So that's kind of the reason why I was leaning, but also the fact that I, I, was, I usually performed better in, like, STEM, mm. math, yeah, technical. Yeah, me too, me too, yeah. And um, so about, it was really funny. So my my first program, so I didn't program in high school. I know a lot of kids now are programming in high school. Okay, like, Co yeah, learning code and stuff. Yeah, like that, yeah, yeah. So I, I met a lot of high school kids that are like, oh yeah, we're like, 
you know, we're learning this and this and this and learning algorithms, learning data structures and, and, and in high school, I'm like, wow, like that's great. You know, I, I didn't have that in high school. I was really focused on taking like tons of AP classes mm -hmm. and trying yeah, like, same. so I, <laughs> I was funny. I, I actually took enough AP I actually got enough AP credit that I, I actually started as a sophomore in college. Right. Still took me four Coming years to graduate. Like 60 credits or yeah. something. Yeah, like <laughs> it was like 32 <laughs> credit hours I had. Uh, but it was enough credit to actually get me um, most of my first year. Basically started as a sophomore. Nice. But still took me four years to graduate. It is one of those. Uh, but so anyways, um, I, remember, I remember it was one of my first intro, like, uh, computer science classes. And okay. And... I remember I, I just never programmed and I was like, I don't know what this is, you know. And I was like, sounds cool. I wanna learn it. And uh <laughs> it's kinda of embarrassing to say, but I it, it makes a funny story. Uh I did so bad. Like so you know, like you know like most college classes today is like there's a certain drop date. Like you can yeah, drop yeah. the class. Yeah, withdraw, yeah. Yeah. Um so our I, I remember exactly, but the the midterm was after the drop date. Or something like oh. that, and I took the midterm, and I was, I, I was, I was struggling so hard in the class, and I just like I don't get this. And the professor is like, "You're doing so bad. <laughs> I'm gonna let you drop the class. I'm gonna make an exception for you, because <laughs> he likes me as a person." <laughs> He's like the pity drop. The pity drop, right? Yeah. <laughs> He's like, I feel so bad for you. I'm gonna let you drop the class. So I dropped the class, and I spent the rest of the semester just trying to learn how to code, learn how to program. Mm. And it was tough. It was, you know, I don't know. It took me a while before I like kind of grasped the concept. So you weren't discouraged by the class? Oh, I was. I said, I swear this off. I'm just gonna get by this class so I can pass. Oh, so you didn't drop? No, I. I'm sorry. I did drop the yeah, class. I did yeah. drop the class. Um, I didn't like. I didn't. S completely sway me away from like right, right. like for most my, it would for, well it, it it got to the point where i was just like i'm i just need to i'm gonna redo this class next semester i'm oh, gonna okay. learn this stuff like by myself was Would, it mandatory for the, yeah it was, oh, it was man so that's the thing it's like if it was right. a, an elective you're like ah, pff, screw it i'm yeah. just gonna pick another elective <laughs> yeah i literally was like no it was part of the, as part of like our electrical engineering yeah. department because our field is so vast you have to learn how to program that's cool. now how much programming? Obviously not as much as like a computer science major, you know. We're electrical engineers. We touch lower level code and I'll get into the details about that sure. later. But um it, it was one of those situations where I said, I don't want to do this. This sucks. <laughs> but I, I I was like, I know I have to pass this class in order to get through my yeah. major. So he let me drop. He's like, you know what? This is what I recommend. Study up on this, study up on this, and then come back next semester and do this. But he, I, I was like, but he, he, that professor was like a saving grace. He's like, he's like, you know what? He's like, you're doing well in school. I don't want this to be like the one thing that's going to like hold you back or ruin mm. you, right? So he's like, he's like, yeah, take the time, you know, learn the material. So I did. I took the time, learned the material. Okay. Basically taught myself how to code. Um, and so, <laughs> but man, when I was going through it, I literally told my, you know, my my college counselor, I was like, I, and I think there's a quote from me somewhere saying, I will never major in computer <laughs> science, ever. And by the way, my master's is in computer science. That's awesome. <laughs> so I literally said, I'm never majoring in computer science. This yeah. is awful. I don't know why any any person would want to do this. Right. So I, 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 uh, I, I taught myself, uh, actually went back to do the class, got an A in the class. And then I still was kind of like, swear, I was enjoying it more. Okay. There's a little bit of a... A learning curve for sure. There's a huge... The learning yeah. curve is steep when you want to learn how to program. But I remember um, thinking to myself, I was like, this... <laughs> I was like, this is one of the hardest things Like I felt like I had to learn. Because it was just oh. like, every student that I was in class with felt like they, they had already knew how to program. Mm. And um, yeah. So basically, so I learned how to program. And it's kind of funny when... When you first learn how to program, I don't know if you know anyone who's listening to this, if you've done your first program, first couple of programs, when you finish your program and you watch it run and produce the results you want and it's passing all the tests, mm. it's kind of of a it's kind of like a a little bit of a high uh, almost. Okay. A little yeah, bit of a high, yeah. like to watch your watch your program run and complete like 
That's dope. Like I watched my pro- I did that. I, I yeah. did that. It's running. I built that. So the class went through. I was, you know, it was hard. Ton of technical stuff, but I was starting to kind of get that high with each program I finished. Right. Mm. Then I had to do one more programming class as a requirement, and mm. by this point, I was actually getting pretty good, and and every program I finished, like I said, I kept getting that. I watched that program finish, finish yeah. running. I was kind of getting excited get some momentum going yeah and i I, you know that kind of got addicted a little bit Mm. i don't want to like relate computer programming to like drugs oh (laughs) that's what it is but like that that high started kind of you know with each program i finished i was like this is awesome watching it finish watching it run passing Mm. all my tests so then by my senior year um there was one more option as an elective to take like this microelectronics class to um do more programming i decided to do it and it was tough um and I did it, and like I said, I enjoyed every single second of wow. it. So at this point, I'm I'm like in my first semester of my senior year, I'm getting ready to graduate, making sure I've met all my requirements, and I'm like, I really like programming. So this is when I started to realize, like, kind of like this, you know, tipping point, tipping yeah. point, right? I was like, and I was talking to my friends and my girlfriend, you know, my fans at the time, nice. I was talking to her. I was like, hey, um, should I, should I switch or what am I doing? Said, no, just Finish your major and, you know, try to find a job maybe that will let you do something like that. Because I know a couple of electrical engineers that switched in, like, programming full time. Oh, okay. So uh, what happened was <laughs> I went to go work. And my first year working, it was fun. You know, I worked at I worked at ComEd. Okay. Um, I worked as a I – as, I worked in Smart Grid. So I was working as an electrical engineer there. And I went to um, – uh, what um, I went to Relay Protection, which mm. is – uh, another type of electrical engineering role, but this was all in the field of power and distribution. Okay. So there was like no programming. And remember kind of earlier in the interview when you were asking me like, what's a software engineer? And yeah. I was like, I was like, it's not like opening a standards book and like, you know, following directions. Following directions. Okay. I felt like I was doing that a lot in the oh. job. And I, I, I just wasn't happy. I, yeah. And don't get me wrong. Like the company was awesome. Right. My career was going in the right place. But I you was, just felt caged. And I was promoting limited, fast maybe. too. Yeah. I, 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 they actually, I, I love my bosses that I had there. I promoted with like maybe not six as stimulating. Early. Right. Yeah. It was, it was hard because like literally I, I wake up in the morning and I, I wasn't excited to go to work. Mm. And I, I'm a strong believer in like <laughs> not, not being, I'm a strong believer that, you know, if you, what was I saying? If you, if you like really, really enjoy what you do, it's like never working a day. Yeah, it doesn't feel like work anymore. (laughs) I forgot exactly what the exact saying is, but you'll never work a day in your life, kind of. Yeah, yeah. yeah, So, you know, by the time like I was like not three years into the company, um, I decided I was like, you know what, I I'm not enjoying this anymore. Mm. I definitely felt like I was, kind of just. I felt like my career was going. Up, going the right way. I was climbing the career ladder. I, I was, you know, my bosses loved me. I love my bosses. Love my coworkers. We all really enjoyed each other. Uh, but I just wasn't happy with the work. Yeah. Um, so, so what happened was, um, like, uh, like, my, so, not to get into like too many personal details, sure. but, um, my my parents got divorced when I was really little. Mm-hmm. So I kind of grew up without my like biological dad so much in the picture um and my mom got remarried Mm. and um so my stepdad who i when i say dad a lot i I reference my stepdad okay um so he like from when i was three four years old until you know 24 25 yeah Yeah, he was always in my life and he uh he passed away in his sleep one night and i was actually out of town and my sister was there when he passed away. It was really sad. And uh, when he passed away, a couple of weeks later, I was thinking to myself, I was like, wow, God, life is so short. Mm-hmm. Like crazy, crazy short. And I had been saying to myself, I'm like, I'm going to do something. I'm going to do something. I'm going to make a career change. I'm going to do something because I'm just, I don't feel, I don't feel. Fulfilled. For, I felt, I didn't feel, I, I don't, I, I hate saying that I didn't feel happy. I was very happy. Being a combat, I was very happy with the work environment. I was very happy with the people I worked with. Mm. It was just the work was not what I wanted to do, yeah. you know. And so when when my dad died, um, it was like a wake up call for me. Like I would say within like two weeks later, 
I was applying for my master's. Mm. And I decided, I was like, what did I really enjoy doing? I was like, man, I would love to write code again. I would really like to write code again. So I applied and started my master's. I I quit my job and I started my master's. Mm. And uh, and it was one of those things that um, that was kind of like a shot in the dark. I I didn't know what was going to happen, where I was going to go. My mom, my mom supported me. At first, she was a little bit like. Hey, I, are you sure this is what like you want to do? Like you had a great job. You have a great job, you know. My mom was like, you have or, a great did, job. Did you did the job pay for grad school? No. Oh. Well, they would have, but then I would have been committed to them for three more years. Oh, gotcha, and I was gotcha. just like, no, this is not what I want to do. Actually, um, so what I I actually stayed on like part time, working okay. part time for a little bit. They were super cool about it. I was just like, but they knew what I was doing, so <laughs> it was. They're, they knew that I was going to school for computer science, and computer science doesn't really apply to the yeah. work. But they were they were super cool. Actually, it was really cool because I got in with one of, a new department, actually, SmartCred, and they were doing a lot of research work. So they were like, hey, actually, with a computer science degree, that might actually kind of be useful. So I actually stayed on for uh, about another six months, mm-hmm. you know, eight months with them. Uh, eventually started my master's. And, and you know, and during my master's, I, I worked for a startup. I taught oh. and um, like TA or actually TA. Taught. Oh, well, okay. sorry. Clarify TA. I was a lab TA. I felt like oh, I sure. was more than just grading homework. Like I was teaching sections and I was also oh, great. Okay. lecturing for my professor when she was out of town at okay. conferences and stuff like that. Wow. Yeah. So I can talk more about that if you want, but oh, yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, I guess like to answer your, that was a long winded yeah. answer to your good, question. <laughs> no, we need, we need, we but need how I got interested. Yeah. Sure. So that's kind of how the outline and I got started and did my master's and yeah. So that's how I got into it. Okay. So a couple life events, couple realizations. And I think, I think uh, people always enjoy the fact that I swore off programming and then now I'm doing this full time. That's awesome. That's <laughs> awesome. So while you were at ComEd, did you do any coding on your own in your personal time? You're like, mm. I miss it so much. I got to do some of it right now. Uh, n- <laughs> be completely honest. No. <laughs> That's okay. That's but fine. It's like, we, we had some pretty, you know, because I come at, you know, it, 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 we, because of the fact that it's like the main source of utility yeah. for the Chicagoland area, there was a lot of time, like the department I was in there, you know, things would go bad and we would have to work late. A lot of times I just got home and I just exhausted. Pa- I just passed out. For you sure. Know? And, you know, I was trying to be active. You know, I was playing basketball a couple times a week. Mm-hmm. I was, I was training, um, and it, I just, the last thing I wanted to do You're was fine. learn fine. something new. But I, I knew I had to make a change. And actually, during that time, I, while I was at ComEd, I actually finished all my testing requirements for um, my professional engineering license. Mm. So that, that's two eight-hour tests. Yeah, two. I think my them. brother just took it. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. I passed both of them, and uh, my mom. So said, then, what are, you, are they useless right now, or? They don't expire though, right? Or do they? Oh, well, you have to keep training up, or oh, otherwise. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, is it useless for me right now? Yeah. Okay. And, 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 uh, first off, because I'm only, you know, like I took the test for the state of Illinois. Yeah. My mom. So, not to go off topic, but my mom, <laughs> my mom gives me crap about this all the time. I did the test. I did everything right, mm-hmm. and all I had to do was wait for to get the experience. So I just needed a couple more years of experience. And someone signs off on you. Get your you get a stamp, don't you're, you? Uh, well, you're gonna get like like a license. And, yeah, 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 yeah. And um, I remember my mom's like, "Did you get your license?" I was like, "Uh." Yeah, I have everything I need. I just haven't paid the hundred dollars oh. for the license." And my mom was like. My mom was like, "You did all that work. You did all that work. You studied for months for those tests, all this stuff." I was like, and she says, "You and you did." And she, you know, um, she, she was just like, "Go get your license." I'm like, "Mom, number one, I don't live in the state of Illinois anymore." Yeah. And number two, I was like, "Why do I need it?" She goes, "It looks good on your resume." I'm like, "Eh, I guess." So, <laughs> <laughs> she has a point there. So it's, I guess, more or less, it, it would be a very nice resume fluffer. But at, at the, yeah, it's a it's a fluffer. Like yeah. it, that, that is a great example of just because you're successful yeah. at something doesn't mean that it's fulfilling, rewarding to be doing it. Right. Um. So awesome to segment into what you do now. Walk me through like the day to days of a software engineer at Microsoft. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I like it. It's. Did you always wanted to work at Microsoft? So. There's the big four. It's uh, Amazon, Google, Facebook, and Netflix. no, not Netflix. Say, what did I say? Amazon. 
Facebook, Google, four. Microsoft. Sorry. Oh. That Netflix well, doesn't qualify as the big four for software. Oh, okay. And so for software, there's a lot of debate about this. If you go on Reddit, there's like multiple debates about I think that's where I found it. it. That's where I found Fang. Uh, yes, Fang, actually. Yeah. So that includes Netflix. Actually, but, I apologize. But, uh, Microsoft, but this is like a maybe a year old. So like they didn't include uh, so Microsoft Ma- for some reason. Microsoft so. gets thrown in and out, in and oh, out. Oh, really? Okay. But when you think of big tech companies, yeah. Yeah, Microsoft always comes up. Okay. I think, um, so there's like, and sometimes Apple gets thrown in the mix. But if we're talking like software though, you're going to, you're going to look at, you're gonna always going to look at Microsoft. Like, sure. you know, when, who's always the big players at like career fairs and stuff like that. It's always going to be like Microsoft, Microsoft there, yeah. Google, Facebook, right, Amazon, right. all those companies. So, uh, have I always wanted to work for Microsoft? I've always wanted to work for one of the, the, the big. big tech companies. Okay. And Microsoft was definitely, I would say, my number two two or three behind. It was always like Google, Facebook, or and a lot of Microsoft. People, so a lot of people are like that. So yeah. it's very competitive, right? Oh, it's did, did you shoot competitive. for Facebook, Google after grad school? I, during grad school, I was applying for Facebook, Google, and Microsoft. So okay. I had I had interviewed with Google and i didn't get it um why not i just i didn't i didn't was have it, the skill that? set that they're looking for oh. <laughs> they no um they their their interview questions make you think and so it's and, worth even just trying like applying oh, yeah, just to go yeah. through the process i was applying you know there's a process where it was it, it, i wouldn't say it was a low point but like there was a point where i felt like i was applying to a lot of jobs and just not getting the ones that i wanted like mm. the big tech companies like I applied to Amazon, and I always felt like the interviews went pretty well. Yeah. Um, but maybe I didn't answer the questions that they were asking to what they specifically liked. Mm. Google was probably the hardest interview I think I've ever done in my wow. life. It was the questions were very technical, very challenging. Like they actually make you code, or oh yeah, yeah. Oh. Uh, they they well, they'll you know they'll make you code right there on the spot. Okay. Uh, and same thing with Microsoft. You know, oh, okay. when I went to Microsoft, it was really funny. Um, when the Microsoft, I, I I always got like super anxious, super nervous about yeah. interviews because a tech interview is there are books upon books on Amazon like how on to, how to interview how to how to do tech ah. interviews. It's like one of those things that you know that uh, it's like you have to prepare for it. If you yeah. don't prepare for it, you're you, unless you're a super genius, it's not a walk in a park mm. because. I mean, my Microsoft interview, I had four technical interviews and then like a behavioral mm. with the hiring manager say, hey, does he actually kind of fit with the team? Yeah. And those technical interviews, they are they are drilling you. They're like grilling you and they are just trying to figure out like where can we like kind of like the idea is how adaptable are you? Okay. How quick are you? On your okay. feet? We want to see how you think. Okay. So they're always going to give you challenging problems. Yeah. And, and people are like, well, I'm never going to see these problems in – in my real work, yeah, that may be very true, but we want to see how you think, yeah. right? So I remember I walked into my Microsoft interview, like I had, I had, you know, I hadn't gotten the Google one, I hadn't gotten the Amazon one, and I think there was a couple more technical interviews that I had interviewed a couple companies in Chicago, mm-hmm. and I just, I, I, I was always like, I would always make. There's usually multiple rounds of interviews, so it's like mm-hmm. the first round and then like the final round of interviews or something like that. I've done like three parters where it's like phone interview. First round of interviews and then final round of interviews, wow. and I've always made it to the final round of interviews, and it's just something I've always seemed to like mess up a question or mm. didn't quite answer it the way they wanted, and it's unfortunately like enough for them to say sorry, you know, try again. A little yeah, bit. Microsoft was like, you know what, I'm gonna be totally cool. I flew out to Seattle. I was like, I'm gonna be totally cool. I just walk in there, just be so chill, and relax, <laughs> and just answer the questions to the best of my ability, and. And got the job, so. But that's all you can do, right? Yeah, and, yeah. But like you've probably realized that yeah. after having not not maybe made the mark at mm-hmm. at Google and and Amazon. Yeah, you know, it, it's it's one of those things that, like in hindsight, I wish I was more relaxed. So to mm-hmm. anyone watching this who wants to right, go in the tech right. field, just stay relaxed, stay cool, prepare. And the best way of staying relaxed during an interview is know your stuff, right? Right. So with with experience, um, what's what's a traditional or an easier route? if this is easy to get experience is it on your own time or to work for maybe a startup or a smaller firm like what where does one go to get that experience so if you're talking about like yeah i mean if you're talking about the the total package right like what like microsoft and these big tech companies are looking for yeah they're looking for yeah experience so the best way you can get experience is 
you know, try to find what I did was I found a startup that was looking for essentially cheap labor, right? Mm-hmm. So the disadvantage of working for startups are a lot of times you don't have a lot of funding mm-hmm. and you have to work insanely long hours to just get this product out, right? Like mm-hmm. get this feature out, get this feature out. And that's one way is like go work for a startup, work work in the field, like work or or try to find a way to kind of just insert yourself into an environment where mm-hmm. you're coding and you're producing like quality mm-hmm. products, you know, quality features. But even more so, just to get your foot in the door of companies sometimes, you, mm-hmm. you need that on your resume to say, hey, I have this experience, I have this experience. Because what the recruiters are going to look for is that when they look at your resume and say, okay, here's the job description. How well does this person fit to this job description? Mm-hmm. That's even the first way to get through. But then once you get through that, then you have to get through the dreaded tech interviews, right? And the best way to do that is to just prepare. I spent a year with one of my good friends too, we spent a year just coding every. So we would go to class, we would do all our TA stuff, and then we would we get done. We would like start at like early in the morning, get done by the afternoon, and then from the afternoon to the evening, I would just we would sit there, we would grab a whiteboard, and we would just code problems, tons of problems. Like what do you mean? Like what do you mean code problems? So like there's there's a set of like there's algorithms and data structures are like the the foundation of computer science and okay. computer software you know so- software engineering it's like you need to know your algorithms and you okay. need to know your data structures your foundational skills your programming skills okay. right and and there's tons of books online there's tons of resources online that have different problems that people have seen in, in real interviews that they ask like mm. you know like given this value or something like so given this like string value, which is a, you know, a set of characters, you know, give me the longest consecutive substring of like conti- continuous alphabetical, it's like continuous, like let's say, let's say I have a string of like just random letters, right? Mm-hmm. But I want to know, can you write a program to tell me is what what is the longest substring of those letters where the letters are one right after the other? So like in that large string, I have like A, B, C, D in the middle of it. Can you write a program to go find the longest mm. continuous string? That's just an example of a problem. And then That's so you would so have- abstract in a, like in a way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, who would want to think of it th- about this? <laughs> yeah, I, I've had I, I've had problems where, um, like I don't know if like you're familiar with like, um, I you know, I just gotta be careful what I'm saying because I signed a couple NDAs to not like disclose sure, <laughs> interview sure. questions. Um that's 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 a public one that the first one I mentioned. But there's other questions that, you know, like let's see. Oh, well, this is one of my favorites is um you have to write a program to multiply two numbers uh-huh. that are more than two digits. Uh-huh. And then those numbers are not integers, so you can't just like type like eight times nine or something like that you have to write a program to like manually do those calculations and i i i, wow. I had a friend who and i me and my friend were doing questions like that and we uh there was one interview there was a couple interview problems where i had to like write a program to like so there for example using like um like drones to fly mm. um and let's say let's there's a big company i'm you know, that wants to fly drones to drop off packages sure, to people's houses, yeah. right? I saw how, a video like that. That was creepy. <laughs> how do you how do you write a program to best figure out which routes is the you know, what yeah, is the best route? For sure. And and you have to think of that on the spot and code it. <laughs> that's kinda cool though, yeah. if you can. That's really cool. Yeah. So um those are some of the like types of oh, questions. Self driving cars. But all those all those questions that they ask are based on a foundation that you, of okay. computer programming concepts that you should know. Okay. So things around algorithms, things around data structures, and just basic basic programming skills. And and, and they're not impossible to solve because you okay. need to be able to use those skill sets to be able to um, adjust to whatever they're asking. Okay. I, 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 I'm trying to be like uh, maybe – some of the stuff I'm saying is a little cryptic sometimes because I'm trying to keep it pretty general because I don't want to get into like the super technical stuff of like, you know, link list, hash sets, all that stuff. Sure, I mean, <laughs> that'll go over my head. <laughs> I want to make sure that like for the general audience, feeling like I'm trying to just give an idea or, like yeah. what these questions are like. It's, it's just basically like very, they give you a problem, right? 
and how do you apply the skills that you've learned to solve those problems? Yeah. And those skills that you have are the skills that you need. So the way that big tech companies do it, it's like, okay, well, this candidate should be able to solve this to be able to work here, mm. right? That's that's the thought process behind it. Okay. And so, but, so yeah. some of those questions that like that I was just kind of giving examples of are like generic big tech company questions that they want to know that you can program. But when you're preparing, like, where do you come up with these problems? So that's are they in the books? They're or in like, the books. Oh, yeah, go through okay. the books. And gotcha. so, tech companies all know what's out there, like problems and stuff like that. So they change it. Mm. So you may do one question in the book this way, mm. you know, based on the way that's question asked. And then later on, when you go and actually do the interview, they may ask the same question, but in a different way. So you have to mm. give a different answer. And so what people get caught doing sometimes is that they like, they're like, oh, I've seen this question before. Oh, and no. They, and they, they memorized and it? Not memorized it, but they know how to do it. And then they try to like do it that way. Yeah. Right. So that's actually is it's one good. of the things is they try question. to they try to do it the way that they remembered how they did it. Mm. And what unfortunately that steers them the wrong way mm. from what the interview is actually asking. It's interesting. Yeah. So but there's tons of resources online. If you go if you were to come by my apartment and look at my bookshelf, the first two rows of my bookshelf are all programming books. Wow. Yeah. A couple algorithm books, you know, and I went through a year of studying before I got my job. Are there certain languages that people should know? Uh, yeah, this is one of my favorite topics. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I There's tons of languages out okay. there. Right? You have everything from, you know, Java and yeah. Microsoft's proprietary like C, uh, languages like C Sharp. And then you have um, Python. You have, uh, uh, you have everything from C, C++. Those are yeah. like your lower level languages where you have to deal with like memory management. So one of the things, not to get too technical, but like, there's more advanced languages now like Python and Java that mm -hmm. do their own um, memory management. Mm -hmm. So like in the lower languages like C, when you when you write code, you have to be careful about how much m memory you're allocating in the mm -hmm. computer to actually run your program. Mm -hmm. um, because if you if you're not carefully managing it, then you can end up crashing your own program. Oh. So I program in higher level languages where in the language itself is built in what we call garbage collection and those go and do memory essentially like memory cleanup of objects mm -hmm. that we create in the language itself so when people want to interview everybody out there yeah. use python uh, i'm a python um so you can choose yeah you could shoot i've oh. i've in all my technical interviews that i've done i've done quite a few technical interviews I've never been told to only use like a this language. Like, I've oh. been, but there, my, during my Microsoft interview, I was asked, I prefer you to program in C Sharp, which is like Microsoft's language. I don't, I, I said proprietary earlier. I don't know if it's proprietary, but when you think of C Sharp, it's, it was developed at Microsoft. Okay. Um, and C Sharp is almost exactly the same as Java. Okay. Like almost exactly, almost exactly the same. All right. Um, but these are higher level languages that, that, that does its own memory management and it, it, you can write very abstractly. So the idea of like creating objects. Um, so for example, if I'm writing a program of like, let's say I'm writing a game of poker, I can create an object of cards that have suits and ranks. And mm. all I have to do is like card dot suit, card dot rank. You can create these very abstract objects, kind of like make programming life a little bit easier to understand. Mm. Uh, sorry, I don't, I'm trying to let my best not to get into yeah, you're super fine. technical. No, you're fine. But it, 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 if there's a language, uh, like if you want to go do these interviews, the language of choice for me, yeah. and some people will protest it, uh, but I think Python, because when you write Python, it's like, when you code in Python, it's like right, you're coding what you're saying. Like, it's it, intuitive. It's, it's so intuitive. That's it's great. It's a super easy language to learn. It's not. It, it's not strongly typed. It, it's it's just one of those languages that like. So when you, in 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 Java and C sharp, what I mean is like, you you have to do something like. If you have like a set of characters, you mm -hmm. always have to like if you create a variable for those characters, you say something like, string that variable name equals this set of values. 
in Python, you don't have to do that. You can just say A equals a set of, set of values. It's very easy. It's a very intuitive language. So if someone were to, were to pick up coding, would it be okay for them to jump to Python, or should they have a, a foundation before they go to Python? Well, it depends. I mean, it depends on what you want to do, right? Like, if, if you're planning to, like, go and, like, really learn computer science top, like, all over it, I, I always thought, like, starting at a lower level, level language first to okay. understand how the machine works, mm. right? Because the problem is, is when you start with high-level languages like Python and Java, you don't understand what garbage collection is. You don't un actually understand, like, all the stuff that's kind of had. Maybe you won't appreciate the intu it, how yeah. intuitive it and, is after. And because of my electrical engineering electrical engineering background i started like super low level like we were coding in zeros and one it's called machine code mm. and and now i'm coding in like python and java and c sharp and i think that having that foundation is awesome mm. but not necessary okay uh but it depends on what you're doing right if you know like if you know for a straight fact that you want to be like i'm just doing front end or back end and that's it i'm never going to touch on like you know, lower level stuff, then yeah, probably you don't need to learn some of those low, low, lower, lower level languages. But I, I think there is some value to learning those lower level languages mm -hmm. to understand how a computer works. Okay. Um, at Microsoft, are you part of a team? Are you working on your own project? Like how, what's the culture like at Microsoft? It's interesting. Um, yeah, I work on a team and, and our team is pretty foundationally set already um like we're just working on like adding features supporting stuff so mm -hmm. what we do is we work on this team that basically we built a very customizable delivery system for mm -hmm. a lot of uh for a lot of like content that you may see do you own an xbox for example mm -mm. ps3, PS3. I have, yeah it's been a while <laughs> <laughs> do you have a uh, a mac or you have a windows I, maybe? mac oh i have both i have mac and, and pc okay <laughs> uh, me too but <laughs> so sometimes when you open your pc you'll see like when you open it you'll see like a screen it's like hey you know it's like it's a nice picture or something yeah like, you like it you can click that and yeah then... actually so my group is the one who delivers that content so all that content is actually being delivered through my group well, like you choose the pictures or no it's like based on user data and stuff like that okay um, but like um, we're like a we're like a very customizable content delivery system. Sounds like you're very niche. It's very, <laughs> yeah. it's very specific. Yeah, and we actually do a lot of um, you know Xbox delivery stuff too. And um, and one of the features that I worked on was actually building out the pipeline for um, for some of the Xbox content to be delivered. Mm. Uh, and that's the team that I work on. It's actually a really funny story. Um, there's a lot of changes that happens at Microsoft. So okay. like kind of compare it with my electrical engineering days when, you know, working in the electric in the power distribution field. Structured. It's very structured yeah. and the fact is it's kind of nerve it's it's a lot harder to make changes quickly um, because of so many people are like relying on you. Like yeah. if the power goes out, oh my God, right? Right, right. It's you know, it's breaking news. Um so trying to employ new tech is sometimes a little bit more difficult a little more red tape around it trying for to, sure trying to do trying to do that but with software we're constantly changing we're constantly we call it dog fooding so it's like trying new stuff before we release it to the public yeah it's like hey how bad is this <laughs> yeah let's, let's try to break this you know <laughs> always testing new stuff so it's always just so quick and fast paced and what i mean by that is so i worked on this uh you know worked on this platform for uh, a couple uh i want to say about five months before we got reorged yeah. and we got reorged and we picked up a project from scratch where we were actually building out fun. yeah we were building out a so are you familiar have you heard like machine learning like AI kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. So machine learning and AI type stuff is where you know you have algorithms that are like have already been built, and you have a data set. It's like we want to predict. Like for example, let's say you have you run a store, yeah, and you want to you have people who have like subscriptions to your store, and let's say you want to figure out my churn rate, like how often would people, based on characteristics of this person and stuff that they do, can I figure out and like predict if they're going to unsubscribe right okay just kind of give you an example of like what you know we can do with machine learning and then from there we can figure out based on your data that you have 
we could figure out, oh, you know, this person may drop, this person may drop, and mm-hmm. kind of have a, some level of confidence of what mm-hmm. what might happen. So we actually, uh, we so we got reorg and we built an entire like platform for for companies and individuals who um, wanted to basically do machine learning without really knowing machine learning, but okay. you know, so like kind of a very general yeah. way of doing it. Um, but then, so we had some. We, we did that. We built that from ground up, got oh. like the version one running. And so that was with my group. So that was more of a team effort to okay. kind of answer your questions. And then once we got that running, we actually got put back on our old project, which is a little bit more of like individual work, but all on the same platform. Okay. So, okay. yeah. So I worked in both like yeah. kind of like a, like individual setting and a team does, setting. Does it feel competitive or like maybe healthy competition? Or? Oh, no, you know what? It I, gu- I guess okay. so. It, I guess it depends on your team. I've heard stories where it's competitive, but I've also heard stories where, like, my team is not competitive. I don't think we're competitive at all. Okay. You'll hear you'll hear stories of companies like, oh, someone's going to be ranked the lowest person, right? Like, oh, yeah, wow. Yeah, but not not at Microsoft. No, it's about they're looking at how how can you what do you what's your impact right like that's the biggest thing is like what's your impact how do you impact the team how do you impact the product how do you impact people that are using your code we call it like upstream and downstream of you like how good is your code that you're making good impact on everyone that's trying to utilize it so it's about your impact and it's not competitive at all in that sense it's really interesting yeah so for on average do you think people are doing this as a resume builder and to eventually do something else like, do they, do people have goal? This is, I don't know, ideal in my head, like have dreams to make the next Facebook or Instagram. <laughs> At Microsoft? Yeah. I mean, um, or like as a software engineer, it's like, how, do, how does one want to make it big? Uh, that's a, that's and, a and, and I know, uh, <laughs> I know, I know not everyone wants to make it big. Some people are, are happy just yeah. working on a team. I feel like on my, on my team, I feel like everyone's pretty happy where they are. That's Mike, awesome. We call it the golden handcuffs. I'll tell you, explain what that means. Well, I, I kind of have a sense of what. what <laughs> it's, you could, it's, t- it's too nice to leave, or like what? Right. Like you're you're comfortable, right? It's it's beyond comfortable. It's Oof. like first class on Emirates, comfortable. That's how they trick you. They <laughs> trap you. Yeah, golden handcuffs. That's all. That's a, I've never heard that analogy, but that's yeah, awesome. They call it the golden handcuffs. Um, wow. It, I don't know how much I could share without getting in trouble, but it's the benefits are absurd the pay is inc- really good the bonuses are the i mean it's no secret i'm not going to say anything that you can't find online but the the if you go and research like you know what benefits do employees get from working at microsoft it's good it's very competitive pay you know and i live in an area where i believe is 20 to 25 percent i would love more. the pacific northwest <laughs> yeah you've been there right? i have been there oh uh, yeah it's, it's expensive <laughs> it's expensive to live there um but microsoft takes care of you and yeah. when i say the golden handcuffs it's more than just the pay right it's the work-life balance is, there are i i can't even begin to talk about the work-life balance yeah. the work-life balance is so good it's actually oh, unbelievable wow. my we work, my team, every team is different. There are teams that are like, we want you here, you know, there, there, there are teams that are like, we want you here at eight and you're not leaving till five, right? Wow. My team is like, we don't, we don't care when you come in. <laughs> we don't care when you leave. The only thing we ask is whatever you commit to finishing, you finish and you, you're there to support the team, you know, if you need to be at this meeting. Sometimes you stay late, sometimes you don't. Exactly. You know? I mean, there are days where, you know, um, that, you know, everyone's in the office just trying to get stuff done. And then there's days where there's, it's a ghost town. You know, people it's to, in the summer, sometimes it's like that because a lot of the employees have younger kids and they're That's home so with nice their kids. And it, 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 like I said, it depends on the group, but my manager's amazing. My manager's manager is amazing. It, it, it's one of those environments that the work-life balance is so stupid good. <laughs> why would you want to leave that? <laughs> That's why they call it the golden handcuffs, right? And the benefits are insane. Like, we have, yeah, the benefits are insane. Our health benefits are, like, it couldn't get any better okay. than what we have. It's, okay. it, the benefits are insane. It, for everyone listening, if you, <laughs> if you go work for a big tech company, the, the employee benefits is insane. I just feel like the overall morale of working at a big tech right. company is just so much higher because there's such a, there's such a focus on employee, like, 
morale, employee health. And, and it's not just like the other thing that is really big at, at Microsoft too. And I, I know Microsoft and some of the tech companies have gotten bad light about this, about like diversity and inclusion. Okay. But I'm here to tell you firsthand that Microsoft is working incredibly hard, probably one of the hardest efforts I've ever seen to actually make sure that we're being inclusive in, in, in all, everything we do. Yeah, who was it? I, I worked with, it was someone in, in my class, actually, and I don't know how long ago this was, this was, but she was at Google, yeah. and they had, a, like, a diversity day or whatever, yeah. and they're like, hey, black people, and, like, that's, and that's, like, that's, like, hearsay right now, but, like, wow. But, you know, I, I didn't really, before her and before you, like, I didn't really know that was, that was an issue. You know what, and, and the thing about d and it, 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 it's not just about, like, it's not, it's more than just what we see on the outside mm. these days. Yeah, the idea of inclusion is uh, we we have to think about like our even like our backgrounds, the way we were raised, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, our thought processes. Our you know, diverse inclusion is is no longer just you know Calling. make sure we need to have a balance of um, male, female, or you know, um, balance and race. It's like okay, how. How are, how are we being inclusive to people with different thoughts, different mm. pro- thought processes, and making sure that we're being respectful and 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 really treating everybody in an inclusive manner, right? Have you heard of uh, Ray Dalio? No. Um, he, he runs a like hedge fund company. Yeah. Um, and he came up with with a book called Principles. Yeah. And he runs his company this way as well. Um, something called something Water Bridgewater or something yeah. like that. And um, it, he runs his company on a merit based. Um, principle right. whereas whoever has the best thought that like holds the most truth yeah is what they'll go with mm. no matter who it comes from so even if it doesn't come from him but the whole group agrees on that principle and whatever right. they're doing they'll go with that yeah so it's it's merit-based no matter who it yeah. comes from yeah so diversity inclusion is one of those like f- topics and fields right now that i think has a lot of growing still yeah. and, you, don't get me wrong like what what companies have done and what individuals like that have already done is is, is amazing mm-hmm. and we're moving in the right direction right mm-hmm. um but there's just always so much work to be done right and yeah. it's just like how do we build an inclusive culture so that we're always keeping in mind of like take being op- open-minded and not being unconsciously biased mm-hmm. towards people without realizing it right. you know right so that's the that's one of the things is DNI is like what I was saying is like it's so much more than what we just see. You know, it's, there's a lot of things. Right, but I, I feel like people that go into the, the tech space are they they do come from like a, a diverse, maybe even a more affluent background mm-hmm. as well. Um, and it's the people that don't get outside of their small towns that end up, even if they're white or whatever race, don't have a world perspective, a world view um, and maybe aren't open to outside thoughts. And it, may, it sends it maybe and ignorance maybe s- leads to fear as yeah. well. I think that's like a Star Wars thing, but like, um, <laughs> but yeah, and and but I think maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but like people in the tech space like generally do have a, a worldview, right? I mean, I I would think so. Yeah, I I I think yeah, I I I think because there are aren't they constantly thinking about the issues that the world has and how how can we fix them? Yeah, 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 definitely. I think the tech industry is definitely. There, I think I think most industries are even like some of the consulting industries mm-hmm. that I've seen are, are, are there thinking, thinking that. Um, but there are, you know, that's not that's not that's only like one part. It's a work in progress. It's a yeah. work in progress for sure. Right? And, and I think large companies are moving in the right direction. Okay. And I think large companies are under scrutiny all the time if something happens. Of course. So um, it's one of those things that. Um, like you said, it's a, it's a work in progress, but mm-hmm. I, I really, really believe that we're moving in the right direction. Okay. Um, so that being said, even with the golden handcuffs, um, <laughs> do you, do you still feel, you still feel fulfilled, right? I do. I, I, well, I don't know. I, I, my mom always says this about me and my, my fiance will say this about me too. She's, is that it's like, you can't sit. They always say, I can't sit still. I oh. always have to keep doing something. And I'm really happy where I am. I'm really, really, Good really happy where I am. I'm not saying I'm unhappy at all. I just, I'm, I'm always looking for that next move, that next step. What do I have to do to get there? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So it's one of those things that is 
I, like I said, I, I know it's one of those things that I don't, I don't feel like unfulfilled. Mm-hmm. Um, but the thing is, I don't know if I'll ever feel like fulfilled. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I've probably <laughs> said this in the majority of my interviews, but the the grass is green where you water it, and not necessarily on the other side. Yeah, right. So. But yeah, I like how you said like I'm not not happy. Yeah. Um. But you always have that itch that you got to scratch. So that being said, are you working on like a side project or a side hustle or <laughs> making an I, app on the side? What are you, what are you doing? <laughs> right now, um, I'm just trying to get better at what I'm doing at work. Mm-hmm. I, I of course I'm always working on side stuff. Like I'm always like, I'm I'm a, uh, what we call we we're like I'm always working on something, thinking about something. There's yeah. a lot of thought about it. I mean, one of my good friends, me and him chat all the time about different ideas. Like, how right, would you right. do this? How would you do that? And we've like, we've tried different things and yeah. failed. Um, but you tried though. Right. We tried to do a couple of things. We tried to put a couple of like interesting services and websites out that did specific things that failed. It didn't do what we wanted it to do. Yeah. And, um, so you don't necessarily look like when, when thinking about these like side hustles, like you don't, you're not trying to make like the next social media platform per se. And that, that's very broad. Yeah. Like, how do you, like, what are you, do you just look at the world view and see like, what could the world benefit from? Or like, wh- what can we do or what can we, can we make to make the world a, a little better? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so actually what, what I always do and what my buddy and I always chat about is, Every single time we get on the phone, every time I'm in town, which I get together and uh, we always talk about like, hey, you know, what's missing? You know, mm-hmm. what or what what is not good right now that we can improve on? Mm. Right. Like the reality of it is, is that I mean, if you look at it, I want to make sure I'm saying this correctly without like saying anything wrong. But like, if you look at like a company like Apple. Mm-hmm. Right. I don't think they even invented anything Mm -mm. they just made the experience a lot Mm -hmm. better right i think we're at that point now that anything you think doesn't exist yeah they weren't the first mp3 player no and they weren't the first (laughs) they weren't the first they weren't the first computer either and they were just they just figured out how to do it better than everyone else right um well today i'm an android guy but (laughs) whatever uh but but the reality of it is is that i mean like Google didn't invent this first search space either, you know. Yeah. And the reality of it is, they just did it better. Who remembers Ask G for Yahoo? <laughs> <laughs> Yahoo. Um, There's a time when my mom used to say to me, like, "Oh man, Yahoo's big. Like they're never gonna go away." Yeah. <laughs> and look, Facebook didn't invent the first. Social no. Media. And the reality of it is, is like, Zenga. <laughs> my, MySpace. <laughs> so the the reality of it is, is that you're not going to find the first yeah you're not gonna whatever you think thought of someone's already thought of it Mm, anything okay and i'm telling you me and my buddy have tossed around ideas a lot of ideas and every single time we go we just go do a quick google search and we'll find it you know yeah we've tossed around ideas but the you can't you can't like you can't just you know oh it's exists out there well i'll give up on there and work on something else you know yeah you're never not gonna find your idea out there but you can greatly improve on whatever's out there. That's the vehicle that you have to use, right? Like that's what you have to, that's what you have to do. So if you wanted to, let's say you're using Instagram and you wanted to add a feature that Instagram hasn't implemented yet and you're trying to practice the code, does that mean you have to, how do you, do you practice that one, the coding just for that specific feature or do you need like the base code of like Instagram? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, also, uh, well, Facebook owns Instagram and yeah. There's no way on earth you could ever get access to that code base. That's right. so locked right, up. Right. If you wanted to add a feature, that's interesting. Um, I'm not sure I can get a job with Instagram. <laughs> well, I guess when you're when you're practicing code, do you need to know any of the foundational stuff, or can you just like make it oh. arbitrary? You like to yeah. You but can, then how do you test that if you don't have like the base? You know. Uh, well, you can you can you can build like, I mean, I guess so. I'm trying to like navigate your question here. Yeah, so it's, like it's weird. This is from an outsider. <laughs> so well, let me maybe I can clarify. So you're saying build like a feature for Instagram. Like let's say you want to build, I don't know, like add additional filters. Sure. To, it, uh, I don't, you would you could probably just 
build those filters for your camera. The thing is, is like you're never gonna get access to that code unless you work for them, yeah. right? Um, but you can build features around a framework that you can use as like a proof of concepts, I mm. guess. Like a, you can build a proof of concepts and say, hey, this is the feature I want to add on it, and then you know, ever, you know, I don't know, sell it back to Facebook or something like that. Mm. But, um, but that's kind of can you test it without without N- that uh, unless unless. Unless I don't know this fact, and maybe someone else online does. Um, unless Instagram has like an open API where you can test stuff, okay. I highly doubt it. Okay, you could probably write like something over Instagram. Yeah, I don't. I don't know how you would do that because, like I said, you can't integrate into their code base. That's yeah. just not going to happen it's because you know, know yeah. it's it's proprietary to Facebook, right? So yeah, what are your thoughts on? Uh, we kind of alluded to this earlier, but like the you know maybe 10 year down 10 years down the line <laughs> uh, how how much tech is going to take over things like you know that video i saw an amazon blimp like with drones coming out of it yeah or that day the world almost burned down because instagram facebook like shut down and blacked out or whatever because yeah. the server you know whatever but like how scary is that scary to you no I'm excited. you're on the inside oh you're excited i'm excited <laughs> people are like ah oh, they have too much of my information i was like them then don't put your information don't put there. your information out there <laughs> no um I know people who are like still nervous about even putting their credit cards on like Amazon. Yeah. And the reality of it, it uh, I say that a lot, but the thing is, is that um, um, I, I'm really excited for this. Like, and, and, and I know privacy is a big concern. I work in, a, like I said, I work in Microsoft and I know privacy is our number one thing. We do training on it every year. Like your information is this, it's it's pretty safeguarded, right? Okay. Like we don't. It, it, it's not one of those things that we can openly like sell or right, people have this right. misconception like, oh, we're selling all your data. It comes from ignorance. <laughs> yeah. So, the, but it, what about what about when when businesses want to use put ads on Facebook? How much data is accessible to them? <laughs> I mean, because no. things like oh, I want to tailor my ad to people that like um chicago or yeah. or career advice or whatever and like i can do that there are yeah i mean you you you, you, you you've whatnot. done like google searches for like i really want this pair of shoes and then you go on instagram and, hey those are the same pair of shoes I, I literally just looked up right um but i've i've also heard people say that they've seen ads for things that they did not google this happened to me what? so there was a we have a couple google home devices at home yeah um, I don't even know if they have Google devices. It's like, where, <laughs> who's listening? <laughs> it's pretty scary. Like, uh, I was just having a conversation with someone about this. Uh, my 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 office mate and I, I said I was just talking to I was just talking at home about this, and I go online and it's like one of the first things I see. I don't know how this is possible. <laughs> it freaks you out. And, and to be honest, I don't have all the information on that. I know that yeah, yeah. your your information, some of your search information, does get for sure sold. But, but you actually searched for it. It's it's when you don't search for it that <laughs> sometimes I think it's more of a coincidence. Okay, okay. I think it's more of a coincidence, but maybe we'll stay ignorant for now. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> hoping. But no, I, to answer your first question, yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited for that tech is taking over because it should. I mean, like the. Re- in, in we're doing so much machine learning and AI stuff mm. right now that our 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 computers everything is becoming smarter. Mm. Every single thing is becoming. Even our thermostat knows what temperatures at the house just on our usage. When, when you pattern. pull into the garage, even yeah, you know, when you come exactly. home, and yeah. then it, and then it changes it when you leave home. Yeah, I mean devices are getting smarter. Yeah, everything's yeah. more connected. You've heard of IoT for like Internet of Things. No. So Internet of Things is. Like your smart devices, right? Uh, everything's connected. And people are like freaked out, like, oh, they're you know they're stealing all my information. Yeah, they have access to your information, but like, there are some very strict guidelines behind that, and I don't think it's gonna get to the point where, like, people are just full on stealing your identity or mm. anything like that. Yeah, you may feel a little violated when you see ads that you weren't looking up, you mm-hmm. know, but, but every single time we buy something online you know every device that we pick up we're becoming more and more connected and i love that i think it just makes our life more seamless just easier to navigate i'm a i i i i am i am a fan of technology just yeah. continuing to take over yeah i mean i have to be right i work in the tech field right, right. i can't work in the tech you field can't say, go, like i hate tech <laughs> <laughs> i can't work <laughs> i can't work in the tech field and go yeah this is an awful idea <laughs> Um, I don't know how I'm not really a political guy, but have you heard of uh, Andrew Yang? 
I, well, kind of, uh, yeah, yeah. He uh, he he understands the the direction that tech is moving in yeah. and, and the future of uh, of jobs. Yeah, and and it's eliminating jobs. When we have <laughs> when we have automated semi trucks, fast food workers. Um, things that like retail, like maybe you don't, you don't need people at the counter anymore. Um, the movie theater that on Roosevelt, um, that there are people behind the counter, but you're still like paying for everything automated. You're choosing what you want on a screen and you pay for it right then and there. And then they just go fetch your stuff. Yeah. Um, so that's what, I guess that's what's scary is that it's going to be eliminating jobs. And I think that's where people that were borderline in the last election probably got scared and was like, you know what, I need Trump to shake up the government because I'm anti-institution and I don't trust the government anymore. Mm. Um, whereas Andrew Yang is trying to find solutions to this tech right. issue. It's not really, it's it's what, it's going to, it's inevitable. It's going to happen. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, I, I always, I always say that I wish I was born a hundred years later so I could mm. see what the world mm. would be like because I just, I'm that big fan of tech and I just, a hundred years from now, I'm just. Well, maybe by then we'll be able to live another hundred years. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know? I read this article that said that, like, that the next person is to like, uh, there's someone. Now, I was reading this inter- ar- interesting article that like some someone in our generation now is gonna be the first one to live, you know, past 200 years old or something crazy oh, like that. Wow. Yeah, I I don't know. Like as tech gets more, inva- I'll explain that in a second. But to answer your question about what like, so. Is it, are you asking like my feeling on yeah. on how tech is taking over you're, jobs? You're, yeah. I mean, but you're. It sounds like you're accepting it with open arms. Yeah, I mean, if you look at it in that regard, um, how how tech is taking is tech is replacing people's job. Oh, yeah, right. It's I a think, lot of retraining, right? Yeah, it, you know, yeah, it's 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 not great because you know um, jobs are like you said, like. Um, like even like the movie theater, like everything's pretty much automated now. Mm-hmm. Y- yeah, it, it removes some of those more ma- manual jobs, but I think it also creates opportunity, mm. right? Um, because those systems have to be implemented. Those systems have to be invented. Those systems have to be built. Those systems have to be maintained. Those systems have to be improved on. Those all sound like technical jobs, Toby. <laughs> jobs that these people might not be interested in. <laughs> That's true. It's it's weird. I, it's, I, it's, I, uh, I don't know if I have the answer for that. I know. Yeah, uh, no, I'm not expecting an answer. It's just uh, it's it's nice to hear that, and I'm excited for it too. But yeah. I'm I'm also interested to see how we're going to adapt. Yeah, um, it's gonna be interesting to see how we adapt. Um, actually, this kind of brings up an interesting. Uh, point because when I worked for ComEd, um, we were replacing at the time I was working in Smart Grid, and we were, you know, as one of our efforts was as part of like an investment into the system, they were replacing all the meters mm. to be um, smart meters, right? smart meters, yeah. And uh, all those smart meters would mean no more jobs for meter readers, oh, yeah, right, yeah. So, what ComEd's approach was, well will train them to do other things in the company. One of the things was like there were different programs for them to go into. And, you know, ComEd made that investment to get those employees the right training to make sure that they still had a job. A yeah. job That's know? interesting. So uh, if you look at it in that light. It's just who's responsible for that retraining. Right. Some companies, you know, some companies be like, mm, hi. <laughs> and that's just, it, unfortunately, that happens. You know? Yeah, yeah. Andrew Yang is also proposing a freedom dividend um kind of like the universal basic income like everyone gets like a thousand dollars no questions asked right and it's up to you what you what like what you want to do with it um so yeah it's, i'm interested to yeah. see where that goes it, it it's 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 a scary time but i also think it's an exciting time i agree i agree yeah um if if you could do everything all over again would you i'd probably do things a little different yeah yeah i probably would have just I guess, but growing up these days, you would have probably learned coding a lot earlier. Oh yeah, right. Uh, you know, if I, if I, if you know, if I was to tell, but who, who's to say you would have liked it back then, or like at an early age? Yeah, like, I don't know. you know, I, I probably would have liked it if I had started in high school. If I was yeah. forced to learn in high school, I, if I, you know, I'm always gonna promote like coding to mm-hmm. like high schoolers. Like, yeah, is there a coding class? Take it. You know, yeah. like absolutely, like computer science AP. Like, yeah, take that. You know. Um, 
I wish I would have started earlier. Mm. I kind of started later in life because I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. But hey, we're on the same boat. <laughs> so if if someone were to learn, try to learn coding, there's a web, there's a free website, right? What's that? What's that website? There's tons of what there's coding ton. bootcamp or something like that. There's tons of website. You can go, you know, you can teach yourself how to code. It's um, there's tons of websites for you to so, like go and learn. You know, you don't have to go get a master's in computer science mm. to learn how to code. Do you know anyone that doesn't have a master's in your team? Yeah, my boss. Get out of here! Yeah, yeah, yeah. My boss doesn't even have a degree in computer science. He okay. has a, he he has an undergraduate in mechanical engineering. Okay, and he is my technical lead. But uh, but he did he teach himself how to code? Yeah. Oh okay okay yeah he taught okay. himself because it code. would feel weird to be led by someone that doesn't know what what you're doing. No he he is a an amazing coder. That's great. Yeah, I, some of the smartest coders I've met, programmers that I've met, don't even have a college degree. Uh, Wow, and do you think that's across the board or just for Microsoft? Uh, I mean, everyone that I've met has always bl- like blown me away. Wow, and I've, um, yeah, it's completely blown me away. Wow, yeah, I've met a, a couple guys that literally just, they just loved it, and then they just mm. taught themselves. Just yeah, yeah, it's, it, it's some of the stuff that you could. It's a really interesting art, you know. Okay. It the reason why I I don't know if I said this earlier. It's one of those things that. You can just open up your laptop and change the world. Ooh. You know? That's profound. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I um, That's kind of the reason why I picked it because, you know, it's, it's not like you have to pay someone to fabricate what you just, you know, what you just built in your, you know, like if you build some circuitry or something like that, you know, testing it, it's a lot tougher, more involved, trying to like mass produce it with code. You could just write some code, put it on a server, everyone has access to it, you know? Wow. And then there's the idea of, like, open source, right? Um, writing code f- for good and yeah. open s- k- making sure your code is, like, open source so other people can use your code to do other stuff. Okay. You know? So I love that idea of, like, this open community of people that share code so that you have one idea. Here's a, th- here's a thing that I've learned yeah. about not even just in computer science, but, like, just working, you know, the idea of knowledge transfer yeah. and having other people, having other th- people who look at what you're doing and giving you other perspectives. Right. right, right. That's how we succeed in life. Right. And, oh, yeah. And back to DNI, having that diverse and inclusive mindset. Like if you have a diverse, yeah. it's a diverse set of different perspectives. Right. That's how companies are successful. That's how groups are successful. Right. If you sit there with the same, you know, if you if you sit in a room with 18 people who think exactly the same way versus a room with five people who think completely different. I would always bet on the, the group of five. You're right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, so when you're trying, if you were to try to build your name, your brand. Okay. That's all right. Interesting. <laughs> and you want to get your work out there. What platforms, um, in addition to social media, would you, maybe you probably mentioned open source, but yeah. like, are there other like official platforms to like let people know like what you're working on? Oh, yeah. I mean, like, uh, so GitHub is like... Um, I've never heard of that one. <laughs> Microsoft just bought it. So oh. Microsoft just bought GitHub. It, it's a it's a place where you can put your code. Oh, okay. And um, people have access to your code. And, yeah, I mean, you, I've used tons of people's libraries on GitHub to do mm-hmm. my own work and open source stuff. So what it is is it's just like a giant repository, very clean, very organized, and you can just put your code on there and other coders, other programmers can go and... Yeah. Look at your stuff. There's always like a README attached, like you describe exactly what your code is doing, and, oh. and it's open source. So, uh, and if someone's like, "Hey, I think this is a better way of doing this," so they can see all your code, yeah. right? They're like, "Hey, this is a better way to do it." They make a thing called a pull request where they can basically submit like what they think you should replace with what, and then mm. you can go look at it and say, "Hey, yeah, that is much better than what wow. I'm doing." Wow, and then you can go and just basically update your code with their code automatically like that. And now that's what the happens idea to you? Do you give them a, a credit, a kudos, or like <laughs> you're just or everyone is just collaborating you're just together, contributing? It collabs with perfect words. That's it's so like cool. Collaboration of great minds. You that's know? so cool. Yeah. Um. So that being said, like, how organized are you in life? Like, I feel like when you're reading someone else's code, and like you can tell when someone's like, I can't break this down, or like, do, is that that's probably a skill set to be able to to search through the mess. Mm-hmm. And, and find maybe what's wrong with, with the code or what can be approved on? I mean, that's, that's a tough question. 
when you say organize, <laughs> when you say organize, you mean... I guess like no, I don't do my, I don't, I don't make my bed. I don't, I don't, I don't, you know. No, I, my 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 sister, my sister would say I'm the most unorganized person. <laughs> <laughs> but when it comes to code, uh, yeah, I like to keep very clean code. Um, mm. I guess how do I answer this question? I don't know. I. I I, I, I'm pretty trusting when I'm looking at open source software and I see a lot of people like contributing to like a, a, a code base. Um, usually I, I wouldn't like go and just dig through and try to find something that I could improve on. But if I'm working on something and I say, hey, maybe this would be a better idea of doing it this way or something mm. like that, then uh, yeah, then that would be like an ideal way of like saying, hey, maybe we should update the code here to do, to do it this way better sure. or something like that. But in... I'm trying to fit the word organization in here. Um, I don't know. Um, so, what do you mean? Is that by, like, not the right word, or is is there is there an organized way to write code and a disorganized way to? Oh write yeah, code? <laughs> yeah. There there is good structured code. Oh, okay. is that what you meant? I'm yeah. sorry. I, I think I missed. I, I, I guess I guess I tried incorporating your personal life into like. <laughs> does that tra have any translation into how you write code? But maybe not. Uh, my life is a little bit of a, <laughs> <laughs> my sister is like the most organized person I've ever met in my life. She's always like calendar plans, got everything she wants. I call my sister. I'm like, Hey, what are you doing on Friday? She goes, I, <laughs> I have this and this and this. I have this and this and this and this. <laughs> I was like, so you have no time for me. She goes, well, you, you can put it on my calendar. I'm booked like three weeks out. I'm like, all right, well, this is, let me know when you're free. She goes, well, you want to book? I'm like, nah, just let me know when you're free. <laughs> and my sister just, she hates me for that. She'll tell you I'm the most like. In terms of like, just spontaneous. Spontaneous. Let's call it I, let's spontaneous. Call it, let's call it spontaneous. <laughs> um, but my code, I, I I I do take pride in keeping clean code. Okay. So, the cleaner your code is, the easier it is for the next person to understand it. Right. Right. right? right. So you're not coding for you. Like, mm, think like of it that, that way. Yeah. You're not coding for you. You're coding for everyone else. Okay. So someone's gonna have to look at your code one day, and they go, "What the heck is this mess?" Right. <laughs> because. You're not going to work in the same department. You're not going to work on the same code base for the rest of your life, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to move on to something else. Yeah. And you hope whatever you leave, someone else can use it. And you're hoping whatever you go on to next, that person did a good job. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Um, that's awesome. So do you have any, like, what's what's the long-term plan for you if, you, if you have any vision of that? Are you still, you, know, you think you're going to stay at Microsoft for a hot second? <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't have any plans of leaving Microsoft okay. right now. Cool. Um, but it is kind of funny that, Ever since I joined Microsoft, I've been heavily recruited by Google. So the big name helps. Facebook, oh, Amazon. Oh, other big names. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Facebook. Is it the big name or they get word of what you're actually doing or? I think it's just, um, you know, you know, LinkedIn and oh. other stuff. I, I put my I put my work out there. Some yeah. of my own personal work I put out there. And ever since I put Microsoft on my resume and I have my resume sitting out on wherever <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. i don't even know where my resume is anymore it's probably all over everywhere um but the thing is is that um yeah it's really funny i, I don't plan on leaving microsoft because like i said the golden handcuffs right, right yeah right, right. and starting all over again i just i don't know if i want to do that but i would not put it out of the question that i want to do something like for myself like more of an no, you don't entrepreneurial. You don't have do you, you don't really have that bug, the entrepreneurial or nomadic oh, I, the nomadic life. <laughs> I like I like a little structure in my life. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. even though I said a little spontaneous, but in terms of like making sure I have a constant stream of income. Yeah. Um it's a little cuz I I gave up a constant stream of income to go back to school and, right, and right. like I said it was a complete shot in the dark. Right? I'm right, like yeah. I have no idea if I'm going to come out here and find a job like yeah. if I'm, I'm going to be good enough. If you if you put in the work and you put in the dedication, you put in the time, you, you something good will always come out of it. I can yeah, well, you'll be that. ready for when right. the opportunity does does show right. up. Right. So for me right now, um, I, I I've been telling my sister that I was gonna go do my MBA at yeah. some point. Another master's? Ah, uh, yeah, more of a professional degree. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, but like. Am I putting out the other tech companies? No, um, but I really like where I am right now. Mm -hmm. I love my group. My team's awesome. Like the work-life balance is insane, insane. My mm -hmm. boss lets me come back to Chicago because I'm working remote, and he mm -hmm. trusts me that I get my work done. And he lets me come see my family without having to burn vacation days. Well, you just came from Japan. Was that for work or for, for oh, fun? Oh, that's totally for fun. Oh, nice. I, I didn't stop eating for eight days. <laughs> That's how I plan my trips, too. Huh? Yeah. How am I going to eat my way through this country? Yeah. 
That's awesome. Wow. That's, that's yeah. I just I just took some time. Yeah, my boss was super cool. I took eight days in Japan, came back for a day and a half, and then basically left for Chicago. And he was totally cool with it because you know, like I I was saying before that as long as we're getting our work done, we're meeting our requirements. You know, your life is your life. And I love that. I mean, more more countries should or more companies should be like that. Yeah. Because I mean, other companies, a traditional company, how many hours a day are their employees actually like working? <laughs> right. <laughs> no, I don't think anyone's gonna admit to that. No, I know, I know. Um, but Toby, that's. I mean, all the questions I had. Unless you, is there anything you'd like to add to the world of software engineering? <laughs> to the world of software engineering or yeah. life in general, or both? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, for any aspiring software engineers out there, yeah, I promise that if you put in the work and you put in the dedication, the reward is high. The reward mm. is absolutely high. I think, um, and like I was, and like I was saying earlier about how you can open your computer and change the world. Mm-hmm. I think to answer your first question about being fulfilled, yeah, when I feel that I've made a dent in the world, when I've made Ooh. an impact like that, I think I'll feel fulfilled so do you think that's going to be at microsoft maybe possibly yeah. maybe or maybe something entrepreneurial like yeah, start something. make an app or something or... <laughs> apps are a hard way to go are they they are okay yeah there's yeah. a there's an app for everything <laughs> these days it's you have to you have to think outside of the box these days oh. and um but yeah uh I, I feel i mean no don't get me wrong i mean there have been very successful apps like right. you know like but i feel like the the app space is very saturated um and it's just hard, you know. I'm not saying it's impossible. I just say it's hard. You yeah. Know? Uh, you're, like you're not gonna invent anything. Uh, it's hard to find something that has. I'm I'm sorry. I should rephrase that. It's hard to si- find anything that hasn't already been invented. But there's tons of things that can be improved on. Mm. And that's where if you want to like start your own business and software, that's where you have to look. It's like, what can I actually improve on? Because I feel like when you're trying to invent something, a lot of times you may be your time could be used better trying to actually improve on something mm. um but yeah i said in life in general i think if there's something you want to do do it as, right as generic well, no, as, you, you know, as generic but, but as it's for it, it's it's relevant for especially yeah. for you because like you there was a moment in in your life where you realize like we, we got this one life yeah you got to make it count yeah exactly you can't you can't be even if you're successful in something but you're not you're not f- like happy in it or like yeah. or not not happy but like fulfilled in yeah. it like you gotta you gotta find that one thing right yeah uh, don't let just because like you, you you're comfortable mm. but you don't and you know there's something else you want to do mm. and you just you're, you're scared to take that leap t- right. take it take especially that leap if you're 100%. like within this age range of like yeah. like you didn't have any dependents or anyone you yeah. know counting on you so right it, it, it for me it was like if i don't make the jump now i'm never going to because i mean at at the time, you know, me and my fiance were, you know, we were starting to get more and more serious. I'm starting to realize, like, okay, you know, we're going to stay together. Eventually, we're going to get married and blah, blah, all this she stuff. She took a big risk uh, going out there with you, right? <sighs> oh, her, yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> hey, Lauren's and I, I don't even know where to start to say just thank you. Aww. She, when I got the job, I was just like, Oh my God, I don't, you know, I was just like, what's going to happen, you know? And yeah. and she didn't even think twice. She's like, well, we're going to make this work. That's, and, that's and she, love. Yeah, she she is amazing. And uh, she, when I was doing my master's, man, it was tough. It was a tough two years because I was working, I was doing my master's, and I was doing, I was teaching, doing mm-hmm. a lot of TA stuff. And, and, and I didn't, we, 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 she, support like wow every possible form of support you can offer emotional right. <laughs> every, every mostly emotional i but like days <laughs> i'm just like i don't want to do this anymore why am i doing this <laughs> you know it, it's just like she supported me 100 percent, and and she continues to support me she even you know came with me to to seattle yeah she 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 was a riser in her own company too and she was rising up and she left to find a new job in Seattle because she cares that much about me. That's awesome, man. Yeah, I'm just hoping she doesn't sober up and realize. <laughs> That's fine. I'm just, no, I'm just no, kidding. Yeah, she's definitely going to listen to that part. <laughs> um, okay, well, Toby, thank you so much for, yeah. for coming on. Um, yeah. You know, it was it's infectious to, to see you light up 
into something that you're passionate about. Yeah. And I hope people that are watching um, get that, get that like passion with like find that passion for themselves. Right. And, and it's very rare. So when, when you do find it, please like go after it, hold yeah. on to it. Um, and everyone else, thanks for watching and pay attention, but stay curious. Abla Aloha on to the next episode. Thanks.